Good afternoon. Okay. Hi. My name is Lieutenant Callan Jones. This is Lieutenant Commander Tucker Friesmuth. We're students here at MPS, as most of you know. And we're here to host the Monterey Area Research Institution's Network for Education seminar on big data and ocean decision making. Those were a lot of words. That took me a while to <laughs> practice. So before we start, I'd like to welcome all of our guests that aren't part of NPS. You could identify yourself, let us know who, uh, who you are, where you're from. Start on that end, anybody? <coughs> Moss Landing Marine Labs. Moss Man. Right. Also Moss Landing Marine Labs. Moss Landing Marine Labs. <laughs> Dan Costa, University of Cover at Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. I'm a grad student at UC Santa Cruz. Okay. Shannon over at CSUMB. All right. Anybody else? Ashley Blanco with Oceana. Oceana. I saw some hands back there. Probably Hopkins Marine Station. Hopkins. You guys all Hopkins back there? No, I'm in Bari. In Bari? Yeah. Great. Anybody else? All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'd like to welcome you all. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Laura Good and Amanda Height, who are here from the Center for Ocean Solutions. They're the people who own Marine, and we're all members of it, if you didn't know that. <laughs> so before we go into the panel, I'd like to brief you on the context of why we're here. So Task Force Ocean, how many of you have heard of Task Force Ocean that aren't in uniform? <laughs> Actually, a good number. Okay, great. Next slide. So, big picture. Here's what we know. 5% of the ocean has been explored. 20% has been mapped to modern standards. But we know 100% of the ocean is changing faster than we've ever seen before. Why does this matter? Sun Tzu said that knowing the weather is key to victory and key to uh, an advantage over our enemies. But not only that, knowing, uh, understanding the environment, that includes the seafloor, the water column, the atmosphere into outer space, is key to make better decisions for policy throughout the government and not only just for the military. So our, our CNO, uh, our Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Richardson, knows this. He's a submariner and a uh, graduate of the joint uh, Woods Hole uh, and MIT program. So he, he ordered us to come up with Task Force Ocean. And its mission is to advance ocean science in the US to ensure that we maintain uh, that competitive advantage. The tasks are to assess uh, the current state uh, of our ocean science, assess our capability and capacity to employ that tactically and operationally, and to come up with, uh, to come up with a roadmap for uh, a few end states. The focus areas of the task force kind of are around the big uh, four pillars. Sensing and observation, modeling and prediction, uh, application and tactical decision aids, and our workforce. And what underpins all of this for infrastructure is data science, the ability to make decisions better and faster through the use of data. And that's why we're here today. This is a use-driven ocean science. It's goal-oriented and application-focused. And the end state of Task Force Ocean is that we maintain the competitive advantage in infrastructure as well as our knowledge of the environment. And moreover, that our capability and capacity leverages the full range of science and technology in the United States across the government, non-government, academia, and the private sector. And so we're here today to bring you a diverse group of speakers who can really talk to how we're doing data science uh, in the physical sciences that crosses disciplines. It's not just the military. There's, poli there's, there's policy decisions and conservation. It's not just national security. It's about the health of our planet. And so with that, I'd like to start introducing our speakers First, we have Dr. Jeff Shester. He earned his doctorate in environment and resources out of Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey. He studied the interplay between marine ecology and the economics of small-scale fisheries in Baja, California. He currently works on Oceana's U.S. West Coast campaigns to implement ecosystem-based management of forage fish, seafloor habitats, and reduce fisheries bycatch. Next, we have Mr. Bruce Gritton. He's the Chief Enterprise Architect for Naval Oceanography and the METOC Information Warfare Community Integration Support Team Lead for the Navy's Digital Warfare Office. He currently, uh, sorry, he, his degree is from Florida International in Applied Mathematics, and he was a Senior Executive Fellow at Harvard University. He serves on the Technical Director Staff at Fleet Numerical here in Monterey, and his current focus is on the employment of big data and data science to advance the state of the digital Navy. Next is Dr. Kara Wilson. She's a research oceanographer at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center Environmental Research Division in Monterey now, in Monterey. Uh, her PhD is in oceanography from Oregon State, and her current research interests are in using satellite data to examine biophysical coupling in the surface ocean on global to regional scales over seasonal to interannual time scales. I'd 
last speaker is Dr. Wendell Nuss. He's the chair and professor in the Department of Meteorology here at MPS. His degree is from the University of Washington in Atmospheric Science, and he's also my thesis advisor. So. <laughs> His current research focus is on exotropical marine cyclogenesis, mesoscale numerical weather prediction, mesoscale predictability, and coastal meteorology and forecasting. And finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Marcus Stefano. He's an assistant professor of computer science here at NPS, where he is coordinating the school's data science initiatives. His current research interest is at the intersection of data science and earth remote sensing. He graduated from NPS with a master's of science in electrical engineering, and he was selected as the commandant of the Marine Corps Fellow at Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts, uh, Tufts University. He received his doctorate in imaging science at Rochester Institute of Technology, and he retired in 2016 from the Air Force, where he served as the chief of engineering and integration for the Remote Sensing Director at Space and Missile Systems at Los Angeles Air Force Base. Okay, well welcome everybody. We're glad to have you here. I'm glad to see that we have all the services except the Army represented here. That's awesome. You guys look sharp today. And uh, welcome to our guests to, to, uh, to uh, NPS. Uh, Kellen and Tucker, thank you for, for organizing this. I, I think uh, we're in for a, a fun discussion. And panelists, thank you for, for being a uh, a part of this. I'd like to have, offer just a well, first and also thank you Dean Standard and Dean Padwan and uh, our librarian Eleanor Ullinger for being here with us today. So you certainly have the attention of, of, of NPS for this Marine Forum. Um, so I just want to characterize a little bit as Kellen said part of my background is remote sensing and we tend to think of the world in terms of what is the problem we're trying to solve, right? Whether we're trying to understand the human patterns uh, of movement over the earth or whether we understand things happening at a scale of uh, you know years or you know across many many thousands of miles we're always trying to solve problems that have something to do with time and space dimension to them and, and so we need to synoptically look at the world we have to cover large areas uh, we have to in many cases be persistent about the way we do that um, and, and we want to try to discern something that may or may not be a directly observable variable. And, and we want to try to get that to ultimately make a decision. And that is the end of the, the, the name of the game, is making a decision, as, as, as Kellen referred to. That is what data science is all about. And so we've had this new term, data science, that's kind of conflated with big data. Um, but that doesn't just happen. It happens because you have domain experts, such as yourselves, uh, in, in environmental sciences. You have folks that understand the mathematics of analytics. And you have folks that understand the pipes that need to be built to get to the data and to process that data, that infrastructure that is needed. And so those three together really form the nexus of what is solving problems with data science. So, Traditionally, what we do to solve our problems is we build sensors that acquire lots of data. And we have lots of sensors. We have lots of commercial satellites. We're launching more and more. Uh, we have plenty of sensors on ships, on uh, un unmanned vehicles underwater. Uh, and so we're collecting a lot of data. And so you've heard the problem is not getting to the data, but we have too much. We, don't, we can't process it, right? And so here we come to the, the traditional discussion of what is big data, the three Bs, volume, velocity, uh, and variety. Um, and, and so the question is, and what your panelists, what you're going to hear from your panelists are, what are we going to do about it? Um, and I would offer to you that we need to think about the problem we're trying to solve, right, and think about it in terms of what is the accuracy required to do what i got to do, what is the content of what I've got to, uh, what I want in my data to solve my problems, and what's the timeliness, right? What, how frequently do I need to sample in, in time to help me answer my question? And as we build a framework that can handle lots of data, we should think about kind of the high-level requirements of what we're looking for. So things that are going to seem obvious to you but may not always be obvious as you fall in love with a quick solution to go grab that solution. Things like you want to be able to efficiently store a lot of data and be able to scale up to a petabyte scale in, in this data. Um, and so that's handling a volume uh, dimension of it. Um, the other part of it is the ability to normalize data in such a way that you can take different modalities of data and combine them so you can get a fused type product that gives you more value than an individual sensor looking at the world. So you can imagine something like um, 
uh, environmental data being fused with something like uh, AIS, Automated Information System data, that tells you a whole lot about what ships are doing. But your imagination can go a long way in defining the types of data. But that doesn't just happen. It happens because you've put it in a data store that can efficiently uh, store these things as objects and then be able to query on them very, very readily, very, very quickly, because that's what you need to, to answer questions. Um, you want to configure the analytic part of it so that it can be reconfigured quickly for different people asking different questions. A meteorology question may be different than an oceanography question, may be different than a tactical question to answer a commander's need on the bridge of a ship, right? So, so you have to be able to take that data, get to that data, and then have your analytic do whatever you want to do to it and reconfigure it. And that, again, that doesn't happen. That happens by some thought and, and careful planning. Um, and finally, we're in a world where the Internet of Things is streaming all the time data at us, right? So we have to be able to handle the velocity of the data coming at us. And we have to come up with strategies with how do we do that? Do you batch and then do something? Or do you continually process kind of in a rolling manner? And these are, these are architectural solutions. These are things that have to get baked in. My point is, it won't just happen by one group of guys that you go show up in a room to go do it, your data engineers. It happens by putting data engineers, data scientists, and domain experts together to make it happen. So today we're going to hear from panelists on what their thoughts are about, about this domain. Four questions we're going to pose to our, our, uh, our panelists. The first question is, how do you currently use big data um, in whatever use case you have got or whatever applied physical science you've got? And, and each panelist will take a few minutes and answer that one. The next question is, how do you expect your usage of big data to drive decisions? Trying to get us to that point where, what do we try to do with the data? And, and, and ultimately inform somebody, whether a policymaker or a commander who's got to make a decision in, in a matter of minutes or hours about something. Um, and then we're going to have a little bit more open discussion that kind of asks the question, okay, so what's keeping you back from making that happen right now? What are your anchors kind of holding you back? And if, if, if nothing else needed to be considered, what would be kind of the blue sky solution that you could, if only you could do this, what would that be? We'll call that a rocket. Uh, and then we'll finish up with kind of talking about how do we take these things that seem to be anchors and make them into rockets. And that's, I'll, I'll kind of moderate this as we go along. If you have questions, feel free to ask the question. I've got a mic here, I can run around to you. But our panelists are going to start by just going through sequentially to answer them. And um, I think that's kind of how we'll do it. So we anticipate going until 1630-ish. And uh, we hope you enjoy this. So thanks again for being here. And Jeff, we'll let you go ahead and kick off with our first question of uh, how do you currently use big data uh, in whatever use case you've got? Great. Thank you. And it's really an honor to be here uh, today. And thank you to all of our servicemen and women for everything you do to protect our, our country and our, our precious ocean resources. Um, Oceana is the largest uh, NGO in, 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 the, in the world that's e exclusively dedicated to ocean protection. And one of our, our, our recent taglines that we use is this idea of saving the oceans and feeding the world. And this is based on this idea that you know, with 3 billion people that rely on seafood for at least 20% of their protein, the same basic types of policies that could actually bring back the abundance of our ocean also could, can be uh, helpful in protecting biodiversity. So basically, how do we save the turtles, the whales, uh, but, and also uh, in, ensure sustainable livelihoods for fishing communities and, and, and ultimately food security for, for not only people here domestically, but for the planet. Um, we're now in 11 countries uh, that, that control a, a third of, of the world's wild seafood. Um, and, and our campaigns now, uh, in terms of how we're, we're using data, one of the big ones is on uh, seafood fraud or the mislabeling of seafood. So uh, we recently uh, were successful in, in helping implement the Seafood Import Monitoring Program, uh, given that over 90% of the seafood in the U.S. Uh, that we, that's consumed here is imported. Uh, m much of this is, is the, uh, 20 to 32% is thought to be from illegal, unregulated, unreported fisheries. And so requiring uh, and getting traceability to track seafood from you know where where it's actually produced, knowing where it was caught, what species it is even is critical to ensuring that we can actually combat uh, some of this unregulated uh, seafood that's coming into our country. 
We also spend a lot of time working on uh, campaigns to protect our coast from new or expanded offshore oil drilling. Uh, Ashley Blako in the audience is leading that, that campaign work. Um, and, and, uh, and probably the biggest thing that I work on is, is a campaign that we call responsible fishing. And so this is the idea of how do we actually, uh, in the face of climate change, how do we build the resilience of, of our oceans? And so b basing uh, how much we remove out of the ocean on you know, science-based catch limits, reducing bycatch, uh, and protecting seafloor habitats, uh, these really, we, we feel, are the drivers to uh, sustainable ocean. And, and so we use this data, uh, many sources of data in terms of our campaigns. One of our first big victories, uh, we, we've protected over a million square miles of habitat from uh, the west coast all the way up into Alaska from the destructive practice of bottom trawl fishing while maintaining bottom trawling in areas that are less sensitive. And so gathering data on, on the sea floor, especially you know, given that you know, so little of our sea floor is still mapped and we're still learning about that, how do we actually use the data we have but also take a precautionary approach, preventing expansion into new areas that we haven't explored yet and creating incentives so that if you want to explore and fish in a new area, there's actually a, a, a need to collect science in order to do that. Um, we also uh, were a founding partner, uh, along with uh, Google and SkyTruth, of a really f fabulous uh, now organization called Global Fishing Watch. And what this is, it, it's, a, it's an organization that uses publicly broadcast AIS signals from ships at sea to reveal commercial fishing activity. Nothing like this existed in the public domain uh, prior to Global Fishing Watch. Much of this was, was private. As you said, there was, you know, there's lots of AIS information, but we really partnered and, fi and, and figured out how do we actually use the, the computing power of a place like Google, use machine learning and algorithms to actually track behavior of different types of fishing vessels to distinguish uh, just simple simple ships that might be moving around in the ocean to what is actual fishing activity. And now we're, we're, once we understand that, compare that with you know, how do we understand where the high risk areas are. If there are certain fishing gears, for example, long lines or drift gill nets that catch sharks or whales, things that we do not want them to be catching, how do we pair that with oceanographic understandings and predictors of where those whales or other species might be to know where we're going to have high risk uh, types of uh, moments. So I sit right now on the California Dungeness Crab Fishing Gear Working Group, which was designated by the state of California to address this issue of the, the a spike in whale entanglements off our fisheries for Dungeness Crab here off the California coast. Turns out Monterey Bay is one of the hot spots for that along the entire west coast. And so this, the question is, how do we identify the times and places where there are Risk. We could just close down a major fishery to save the whales, or you know, it, but but that's unacceptable in terms of our culture and our values. It's also unacceptable to be unabatedly killing you know these large whales that, that we that we love here as Californians. So how do we uh, use the information both on where fishing is and where the whales might be, not just where they are, but where they might be, and to predict where these high-risk areas are so that we can actually have sustainable fisheries, we can maintain some of California's most abundant and productive uh, fisheries while also uh, reducing and minimizing the risk to, to wildlife. And so that's kind of a, a, a general intro in the first four minutes, but excited to get into the rest of this, and, and again, really excited to be here. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, I thought I'd start off by giving you uh, the perspective that I sort of bring to understanding this problem for naval oceanography and uh, trying to put together a strategy of how we approach this. So as you heard, I'm an enterprise architect. First thing I want to tell you, that does not mean IT architect. And I, hopefully I'm going to point out why that's an important difference here. Uh, the second thing to know is that I'm not a data scientist. And yet, I'm in, uh, one of the leaders in naval oceanography in deciding what we're going to do in data science. So I'd like to answer your third question. I'm one of the anchors we need to deal with. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully we can handle that. So uh, the perspective I bring to this is, first, uh, uh, what I call, from an enterprise ar architect perspective, what is the opportunity ecosystem we're looking at here? So let me model and understand the problem space, in this case, is it big data? Is it data science? How do those things come together? So I sort of model it, and I call it data-driven decision space. And then what's the maturity of the things that are happening in that domain? Then I take that to uh, uh, naval oceanography and its concerns. I look at capability portfolios to start off. So what does that mean? Well, in Navy MeTOC, we have our set of capabilities uh, where we might be able to apply uh, this uh, opportunity ecosystem to. But more importantly, we exist to serve the warfighter. 
and the decision making that happens. And so I got to understand the capability portfolio of the warfighter. What decisions are they making? What are the gaps there? How is the world changing because of this opportunity ecosystem? For them? I also need to understand capacity. What's our capacity to do this? Uh, what's our readiness? Is our culture ready to adopt these capabilities? How about the processes we have in place to actually produce our products now? Uh, how are we going to have to modify those to meet the opportunities that this ecosystem presents? How about resources? You know, money. We got to keep doing the mission that we're doing today, but how do we also uh, handle the hump to get us new capabilities and deploy those new capabilities? How about skills? Again, I'm not a data scientist, and yet I'm leading uh, a part of our data science initiatives in naval oceanography. I think one of our anchors is not just me. Within our community, we have to bring in uh, the skill sets uh, to address this. Uh, finally, you can't do anything without support, and that includes uh, political support, alignment to higher level priorities, and how supportive is policy and guidance in moving this stuff forward. And just uh, as an example, politically, uh, there's great support for big data, data science, and whatever that means. The question is, what role does METOC play in that? And it's, it's actually generating the political support that's going to help you get the resources that you need to address this. And then finally, i got to look at technology portfolios. And that really means, what are we currently deployed? What do we have? What are we planning to deploy? And what's actually now emerging in an exciting way that's available to us? So i got to take all that stuff and then come up with Okay, how do we, what's our approach and how do we select our projects? And so basically, after doing all that, I'll, what I'll say is, in terms of uh, the opportunity model and the maturity, again, I, I see this as data-driven decisions, which is data engineering plus data analytics, which I sort of see as two different sets of uh, skills and approaches that have to be applied. From the problem sets, we can go from descriptive analytics all the way up to adaptive and autonomous analytics and a bunch of stuff in between. Uh, I believe we need to focus in the METOC world on supporting descriptive and diagnostic uh, analytics initially. How about the maturity uh, of the domain? Well, if you look at um, Forrester and Gardner and references like that that look at uh, the hype curve, you guys have heard of the Gardner hype curve, the where technologies exist, where you have all this hype, they're going to solve every problem in the world, and then they crash. There's the canyon of disillusionment or whatever it's called, <laughs> and then, and then you know, some fall off forever. So we have to look at that, and basically my assessment there is we have positive trajectories in most of the technologies areas, but we're still two to ten years out in a lot of the key technologies. So in my view, what that means, it's time for us to play, but we've got to play with real care. We've got to be careful about the problems we try to solve first so we don't fail big uh, right away. Fail fast, but not big. Um, I also want to say from a capability perspective, uh, there's not just a material solution implications, there's non-material solution. So those in the uh, uh, military understand this thing, DOTMILF, doctrine, uh, organization, uh, uh, training, uh, material, policy, leadership, uh, etc. All these things have to sort of align to actually make things work. You don't just put a computer there and have it work. You have to have the people trained. Uh, you have to have the right doctrine in place, how it's going to be used. So there's a lot of non-material stuff that has to be addressed uh, in policy and guidance. Uh, political sensitivities, they're, um, I think from a METOC uh, perspective, uh, our approach typically has been, I don't want to offend METOC people here, we build the 4D cube. This is what the environment looks like in a 4D sense with time included with our predictions. Come and get it. Good luck. You know, uh, I really think that we need to get to a space that we, we are supportive in extracting mission-relevant information that's are, that are associated with battle space objects and decision-making. That's going to be a change uh, in our environment. Um, and uh, just looking at the technology portfolio, because I think I'm about out of time here, we currently, in the operational arena, do not have the infrastructure or platforms in place to support the capture of the volume of data, the variety of data, to address the velocity. And by the way, I look at velocity from the other side. There's velocity of the data coming in really fast, but then more important to me is the velocity of decisions. We're, we're going to have uh, China's investing in AI. They're out investing us in AI. Uh, we're going to see uh, automated algorithmic decision making in the battle space. How do we react to that? What does that do to the timeliness of decisions? To me, that's the velocity thing that matters. And so uh, I'll end up here with really saying that the uh, uh, 
currently, we focus, uh, there's not a lot of big data stuff just in the MeTalk uh, domain, except what way we've traditionally um, approached it. But there are, in the very short, short term, MeTalk, and in the very long term, there are efforts to actually use like machine learning algorithms to make uh, very short term decisions, hyper local decisions, and then some very long term decisions. Obviously, there's sort of a center area there uh, that we need to address. And I think I'll stop there. Great. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Appreciate it. Karen? Um, so I'm a research scientist at NOAA, and NOAA is a sort of um, unique organization in that we have, it's an it's a agency that does is both a data provider and a data user. Um, there are different parts of NOAA, and there is NESDIS, which is the part that launches satellites, and I'm in fisheries, and so NESDIS is, a, is seen as a sort of data provider, and fisheries is a, a user, and a, a large part of my job is actually being the interface between those two. Um, the time scales can be very different. NOAA traditionally has done weather, um, weather data. Um, and, and when I say satellite data, the data that I'm talking about is environmental satellite data. So sea surface height, sea surface temperature, ocean color, winds, and salinity. Basically things that, that, um, that characterize the ocean. And the, NOAA has traditionally, the satellite um, information coming out of NOAA has been the weather. And so that has a 24-7, you know, we need to know what the data is right now. Um, time frame, but for things like fisheries, our context is a lot longer. Uh, what fisheries does, 95% of our work is doing stock assessments. This very much ties into work that Oceana does. And so for that, our users are interested in, in the long time scale. They want data sets that go back 20, 30 years. Actually, some of their data sets go back 70 years. Well, we don't have satellite data that goes back 70 years. So, um, so there's, there's a mismatch of, of time frames that um, can be an issue. Um, and so um, in terms of, we've talked about these issues of, you know, there's a lot of data and how do people get it. NOAA has a program called Coast Wash, which is a, um, basically sort of tries to help get the data from NESDIS into the user's hands in a sort of more user-friendly way. There's, there's different nodes of, of, of Coast Wash, regional nodes. There's a West Coast node, which I'm the PI of. And we really spend a lot of time trying to work with the users and find out what their user needs are, um, you know, what, how can we make it easier for them to get the data? Uh, one of the things we do every year is we have a three-day satellite course, which uh, is sort of a crash course in satellite data where we, we teach um, uh, green scientists from NOAA everything they need to know about satellite data in, th in three days. It's kind of daunting. Um, <laughs> and um, so in one of the more uh, recent nodes that we just developed, um, and I'm also the PI on, is a program called Polar Watch, and that's basically going to do the same thing, only uh, basically be providing uh, satellite data for both the South Pole and the North Pole. Um, for the North Pole, on the Arctic areas, we have the Alaska Fishery Science Center, which is very interested in, in um, satellite data from the Arctic region. And in the Southwest Fishery Science Center, which is a part of NOAA um, that I'm at, the um, Antarctic um, Environmental um, Research Division, um, which is basically NOAA's entire program for Antarctica, is run out of the Southwest. So we kind of have a foot in both, in both poles. Um, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as a meteorologist uh, and as a professor of meteorology, I guess uh, I would characterize, you know, our use of big data is in prediction. Uh, meteorology is all about prediction. Uh, whether it's uh, what's going to happen in five minutes, uh, what's going to happen in two weeks, what's going to happen in two years, or even longer. Uh, it's all about prediction. Big data for us has a lot more to do with volume. Uh, I appreciate uh, some of the other aspects of variety and velocity, but uh, really the most daunting thing is volume. That's just increased incredibly over, uh, over the time that I've been doing meteorology. Uh, and, you know, really, and I think that's one of the challenges uh, that, uh, you know, that we have in terms of utilizing that uh, sort of traditional meteorology, you know, sort of like if you have one clock, you know what time it is. Uh, if you've got 50 clocks, do you know what time it really is uh, to the precision that you'd actually like? Uh, and you know that really characterizes the prediction problem in meteorology and a lot of the decision making that we need to be able to do. Uh, you know, primarily with the way I would say we are trying to use big data, I mean, again, for me, big data sometimes is how do I deal with the one kilometer resolution uh, view of the world uh, in three dimensions, four dimensions, uh, that's a daunting problem in and of itself, uh, just how to visualize that uh, and get any understanding of the atmosphere out of that. But uh, 
uh, that aside, uh, we, we have you know really hundreds of uh, realizations of that, and trying to utilize that to assess uncertainty and probabilities is probably the biggest uh, push in terms of data science uh, for prediction. Uh, machine learning approaches to extract you know what I'll call the best information, most likely information out of uh, if they're disparate data sets uh, is you know is really important. Uh, that that's kind of the you know where I see. You know, a real challenge uh, in terms of utilizing and trying to utilize, uh, you know, big data sets uh, in, in meteorology. Uh, I think the same is true in the ocean. Uh, it's just the ocean prediction is, uh, you know, is still lagging a bit behind in terms of what's happened in the atmosphere, just because observationally it's, uh, you know, they're behind. And it's a harder place to observe. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, but the same things happening in terms of ocean prediction as well. Uh, how do we take multiple instances of, uh, you know, of a depiction of the environment uh, and come up with what we think of as the truth. Uh, you know, clearly we have, uh, you know, in terms of operational miracle modeling, uh, you know, we have data simulation systems that, you know, blend rather disparate observations together that can certainly be extended into new, new realms. Uh, as I drive around in my car and observe the outside temperature, and I think of how many cars on the road have that information, uh, gee, if we could do that, uh, you know, capture that data and actually depict uh, on the scales that that actually represents, uh, well, there's accuracy issues, but, uh, uh, you know, but those become, uh, you know, exciting new realms of, you know, really trying to depict uh, some of the small scale structures that fundamentally become important, uh, oftentimes in terms of prediction. Uh, yeah, today probably doesn't make much difference. It's pretty much clear everywhere. But uh, if the cloud happens to be sitting over the, you know, one kilometer spot where I'm at, uh, and I said it was going to be clear, you said I busted my forecast. You were wrong because it was cloudy, even though most of the area was clearly characterized correctly. But uh, capturing those details uh, is, you know, really the realm of uh, trying to exploit some of the big data aspects of multiple uh, instances of the environment. Uh, so I think that's where, you know, we get most use out of big data is really machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence sort of extraction of, you know, emerging modeling data sets. Okay. Thank you, Wendell. And this, so this is really a diverse uh, perspective you're getting, okay? This is, so assimilating this is trying to, trying to pull a theme through this is going to be fun for us. <laughs> now, let's put a little finer point on it, and, and the next question I'm going to ask is, Let's think of a specific use case that's really on your mind, right? This year in your research or this, you know, what, what is the thing that's really a, uh, a, a good problem that you're digging into, right? And let's try to define that a little bit better in terms of what decision are you ultimately trying to inform? Who are you feeding this to? And, and if you could a little bit maybe talk about some of the analytic process that would go into it in deciding well, at what spatial scale, at what temporal scale do I need to have data? And what, you know, where's the problem? Is it that I don't have enough data? Is it that I have too much data? Is it that I don't have enough analytic? Let's, let's talk about a problem that, you, that you're encountering. So, Jeff, over to you again. Sure, and, and so the, the, the interesting place that, that I work in, in in terms of, you know, in, in policies, and I'll talk a, a little bit more maybe about the, uh, that, that whale entanglement issue, which I think is on a lot of people's mind lately. Um, there are multiple decision makers, right? There are regulators which have certain levers that they can use. Uh, we have, you know, the state of California legislature. We have the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game Commission. There's also decisions that are being made by fishermen on a day-to-day -day basis. Where do I put my traps? How do I rig my gear? Uh, you know, th those are there are multiple decisions that we're that we're looking at, and I think that's where, uh, you know, we're. I don't think there is, is fully a, 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 a solid understanding yet of what the scale is at which we manage this problem. We could say, for example, you know, we could, you know, based on oceanographic uh, patterns and, you know, and, and what we can understand from, from recent events, you could say everywhere from Point Pinos to Point Arena, the entire central coast, there is a high elevated risk. Is that the right scale to be looking at this? Or is it really you know, the, the canyon edges of, of Monterey Bay are really the, the, the high risk areas because that's where krill are, are found based on where the upwelling is, this area around 200 meters. So can we avoid specific, uh, you know, more pinpoint areas? 
the, what we found is that the more targeted you can get those scales, the more acceptable it is to many you know, fishermen, for example, right? They would much rather hear, hey, just avoid this small area within your fishing grounds rather than, hey, you need to you know, pack up and, and go fish in Oregon or something, right? So, so the, the question though becomes the credibility of that data and the information, right? We're, we found that there is a, a link between uh, indices of the North Pacific high, right? These oceanographic uh, variables and what is happening in terms of krill versus anchovy populations. And humpback whales feed on both. If there's a lot of krill, they feed offshore, largely away from where the crab traps are. If they move in and in where the anchovies are, if it's a weak krill a year, then we know they're further inshore where there's likely to be more overlap or co-occurrence. So in this question of co-occurrence, or what uh, some colleagues at NOAA call dynamic ocean management, where you're, you're actually making management decisions based on more real-time data, um, th there is really kind of a, an overall pattern kind of question you could look at that's much larger scale versus you know the, the smaller scale stuff. But a lot of fishermen say, well, wait a minute, should I, should I really be making my decisions about where I fish, you know, locally based on some index, you know, off of the Aleutian Islands, right? Like, is that really close enough? And so the 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 anchor you might say is there there is you know when, when this affects people's livelihoods, when the use of this information can make or break somebody's business. Uh, someone who's you know put, trying to put their kids through college, there's a high degree of scrutiny on on the ability to predict. The same way you know weather predictions are are hugely scrutinized, especially you know if they turn out to be wrong. And it's really kind of a question of you know you're making making the best possible decision that you have. I think is is where we are. And and uh, I mean ultimately we we're we're trying to move and test this idea of risk assessments first on a voluntary basis to see if you can actually get the buy-in. Can you know weather predictions and meteorological data, climate data really be used? D does it actually work uh, in, in a voluntary scale? And and then once people get comfortable using this information, I mean most people didn't even know you know that we talk about what the North Pacific High Index really is. Now that people understand that and there's this kind of linkage between oh that actually directly relates to my business. The recognition of that, and then the, and then I think it, it, it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight with decision makers. The ability to start making decisions, to get used to the information, and to know how much weight to put on it versus, you know, versus just simply ignoring it, which is the easy option, or putting way too much emphasis on it. These are difficult questions. I mean, one at, at a larger scale. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's been this issue of endangered loggerhead sea turtles that during El Nino events come up from Mexican waters into Southern California to chase their prey, the pelagic red crabs, which you know, we actually have had a few outbreaks of that uh, recently with the warm water. And so uh, a few, you know, several years back, scientists basically said, well, you just don't want to do that when they're, you don't want to have people fishing with these drift gill nets during El Nino events. And so this question of can we predict an El Nino event really became the trigger for what is now actually in regulation. But you know, interestingly, when there's a 50% prediction of El Nino or a 65% prediction, right, what level is enough? And we've actually had to uh, you know, threaten litigation over enforcing regulation like that a couple years ago when our government said, well, you know, we, we need to put the regulation in now, but we're still not, not really sure yet whether there's going to be an El Nino. Things are a little weird. It's not as clear cut. And so being able to have really clear triggers that, that are credible, I think, is, is one of the, the, the key pieces of this. And then knowing ultimately how to respond. Should there be a response at the scale of the entire area of Southern California? Or could we do you know, a, a better job at, at promoting the protection of resources while allowing more business opportunities by getting finer scale data that oftentimes uh, is, is, is more difficult to predict at those smaller scales. But so that's kind of, I think, a little a small foray into some of the, the issues that we're trying to tackle right now. Um, and, uh, you know, but, I, but I think cer certainly this question of, of you know, do you just base something on a pattern from before in the past, like we do with the, the loggerheads down in Southern California, at I think a fairly significant cost, versus can we be much more targeted? That's really, I think, the future. And when, when there's an incentive to, you know, fishermen are saying, look, if you can move, use this new data to, to actually make a closure for a, a smaller area or a shorter duration, 
then you actually incentivize them to really kind of be in the driver's seat with see seeking that information, finding that information, and really uh, looking at the best information they can to believe in it um, versus, versus someone else saying, we're just going to make you use this. And, and clearly, when you can poke holes in a prediction, uh, which you can a lot of times when there's a lot of uncertainty or there's a lot of different data, uh, it's, it's a lot weaker. And so getting, you know, getting the policies to create the incentive to do that and put the hands of the decision in people, you know, in people that may not be used to using oceanographic or weather data, I think that's really one of the big challenges. Thank you, Jeff. Can I ask him a question as part of my question? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, so, so you, know, you talked about uh, your decision makers and whether, how they trust the data and trust the decision support stuff that they're getting. I mean, so when we're in an environment of uh, machine learning and what we will call non-deterministic algorithms, I mean, you can train the things, but you don't know why they're making the decision. Mm -hmm. Are your decision makers going to trust those things? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that the, the initial response, I mean, this is this was, this was a great example is with this Global Fishing Watch, right? Fishermen said, well, look, unless I mark every single spot where I put my trap, right, you know, how is some computer going to figure this thing out, right? You know, and, and, and a lot of it is just simply not, not even knowing what machine learning is or how it works. And ultimately, it's, you know, when you, when, when you actually show the, an example, right? Uh, one of these guys used a pelagic data system, solar data logger, right? All it did was track the location of where his boat was. Right? So it's just moving around, and then through existing algorithms that have been used and trained with training data sets from around the world and other similar fisheries, basically with you know a 95% plus accuracy, you know the the algorithm said, well, here's the spots where you put your traps, right? And and so in order you know in order to actually believe the data, somewhat you know these fishermen had to actually see you know one of their friends or themselves actually use it. You know, and 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 and, tr and and see the results of it, and actually, you know, the the, the truth is in, in the pudding, I guess. You know, the, it, it's it's once they can see, look, this actually is quite accurate. There just really was a, a true, sincere disbelief that a computer could not assimilate or think mm -hmm. as well as a person could to be able to to essentially guess. And so it really took them seeing seeing it in practice. But and I think that's really the you know the, the lesson is that. It's not going to be scientists explaining to these people, oh, here's how it works. You can trust this data. There's going to actually have to be some use and some trial and error. Right. And that's a great point you bring up about credibility. I mean, we talk about data science, that we talk about storytelling with the data, but really the person telling the story has to be a domain expert, has to be somebody with credibility that can communicate. Um, so I think that was a good answer to Bruce's question. Bruce, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, that was my four minutes. Case? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I'll, I'll make this this real short, Aubrey. So, you know, I said we are doing things in this area now. We are um, using Climo and what we call forensic me talk over Fleet and Miracle to uh, support the intelligence community in doing pattern of life analysis and things like that. But that's very slow velocity, that's sort of long-term sort of things. So I think the place that we need to go and the problem sets I'm very interested in are the high velocity decisions that have to happen in the battle space. And so things like uh, automated sensor tasking, and that includes not only METOC sensors that might be on gliders out there flying around to go out and, and get some additional data needed to improve the models, but ISR sensor tasking and how to most effectively uh, uh, schedule and allocate those resources. Uh, automated in the warfighting arena, automated directive alerts. So there's all these uh, con plans, O plans, op task, task force, two plans, all the stuff that's out there. And uh, you know, it'd be nice to have algorithms running in the background and generating alerts when there's a significant change uh, to the plan that uh, may be at the tactical end of the, the uh, arena. Uh, activity forecasting, uh, this is uh, a tra me talk attractors and detractors, a little bit like what we're doing at the Climo, but I'll mention uh, two real fast, adaptive ASW, uh, right now, gee, the, the submarine disappears from the port and you need to sort of wonder where it is, and you can do furthest on circles, like you know, the first day it'll be this far, or next day, you know, that's a huge search space, but by bringing me talk in and, and factoring that into pattern analysis, Imagine, as back to Wendell's point, if, oh, here was the forecast at that time, uh, and here was the actual conditions, and this commander made that sort of decision. So therefore, we predict 
given the current situation as commander. So you can uh, see restrict your search space there. Um, tra trajectory anomaly detection, etc. Uh, one more I'll just throw out there that I really like because in Paula's back there, she really uh, has felt the pain with this. We're terrible at uh, disseminating our data in, in effective ways. And there's uh, machine learning is, is being used for what's called the adaptive mission support website. So the, the, the website itself actually sort of reshapes itself based upon the person that's driving it and the context that they're working in. I love that idea. Imagine not having to design our portal from scratch and just one size fits all. So those are the areas I'm looking at. Okay, that's great about the adaptive part is you're, you're ultimately meeting the, the decision maker at what do they need, right? Yeah. Good. Okay, thanks Bruce. Uh, Kara, thoughts? Um, yeah, I would say the big thing for fisheries, I mentioned it in my first um, opening uh, talk, was uh, really stock assessment. Uh, the big thing that fisheries does is stock assessment. And fisheries is responsible for about, I think, uh, somewhere on the lines of 400 stock assessments a year. And this is not just commercially viable species, but also threatened or endangered species. And it's not just fish, it's marine mammals. Um, and traditionally, the way stock assessment was done, they talk about the ABCs of stock assessment. A being abundance, you get some measure of abundance. B, you have some measure of the biology of the, the thing you're trying to um, estimate. And then C, how much catch. Well, there's something that's missing in these ABCs. It's E, the environment. So traditional stock assessment does not take into account the environment. So obviously, this is you know perhaps something that should be incorporated in them. So there is a, a, a push to get environmental data incorporated into stock assessment, and satellite data is the very obvious way to, to get it. We have all this SST data and chlorophyll data, um, but then you're also sort of left with this dilemma because a lot of stock assessments, they have, they've been doing their stock assessment, and sometimes they've been doing it for 60 or 70 years. And so now, if all of a sudden you bring in environment, it's apples and oranges. So, it, you know, it's, and it's really important in fisheries because the big question in fisheries is that, why, why did our stock crash this year? You know, why is it low now and 10 years ago it was fine? So you really need a consistent time series. So we need consistent time series of satellites, but then it's also, you know, it can be problematic if now you're going to improve it you know, in a really different way to have that continuity. So that's a kind of um, sort of intellectual uh, hurdle or anchor, I guess. Um, but again, uh, I mentioned the satellite class. We, every year we um, bring about 30 people from fisheries and also NOS, which is the sort of coastal part of NOAA. And we show them how to um, easily get satellite data, how to bring it into their um, stock assessments. And so we are making strides on this. People are starting to use it. Um, also using it sometimes retroactively. OK, you've seen that there was a big crash. You know, you expected a, a return, um, a pretty good return, and you got a bad return a couple of years ago. And so you can use the satellite data to try to look at it and see if, you know, was the environment really different? Could that explain why you didn't get the returns you did? Um, so that's fisheries. Okay, thank you. And as you said, the time scale on that is time, the time decadal, scale is right? yes, is, is very much de decadal. And and for most things in fisheries, it's really not synoptic. I mean, most people in fisheries, when you say that they're using near real time data, they're talking about data that was like a month old. So, and this is a very different you know mindset than than you know meteorology, which is yeah. yes, like right now, yeah. <laughs> a month ago. Yeah. Um, but you're still informing decisions. Is it yes. kind of like Jeff was saying I mean, at a very local scale in terms of fish or don't fish here? Uh, well, no, with, the, with the, the stock assessments, the stock assessments are usually made once a year. And so they, you know, this model, they, they put all of it in, they come out with the stock assessment once a year. They, their biology data, their abundance data, they collected on a, on a cruise. So, you know, maybe, you know, so, you know, last year, last month's data is near real time for them. Um, but it's, it's, it's um, basically, once they have the stock assessment, then that information is used to, to set the, um, the threshold, the harvest for the, um, the fishery. So it's very much a policy um, driven, even though it's not, you know, often people think operational equals 24-7. And I, for years I've been saying operational fisheries management is not a 24-7 time frame. It's a decadal time frame. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Wendell? <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, I appreciate the comments in terms of credibility of data. Uh, I, I have to share a story of years ago. Right, an automated system. They put together a machine learning system uh, to determine the time of burnoff of fog for San Francisco Airport. Right, did really well. Verified really well against data sets. Uh, but did any of the weather forecasters trust the output from this black box of machine learned 
uh, predictions, uh, and it's like, no, I want to know which model is right, and you know, sort of traditional look at things. Uh, it's very hard to get over that learning curve uh, and develop that credibility. I appreciate the, you know, yeah, teaching the customer that yes, this is reliable, and it really did predict what you did, uh, and uh, you know, and that's helpful. Uh, for me personally, uh, I'll just use this as an example of, you know, there's tons of decisions like this in meteorology, but uh, I actually support the prescribed burns at Fort Ord, uh, and one of the hard, hard forecasts uh, in that uh, is what's called the mixing height. It's how deep, uh, you know, the air from the surface will freely mix uh, in the vertical. Uh, so for us to conduct a burn, it has to, you know, it has to reach 1,500 feet. Uh, optimally, we'd have it higher than that, but uh, that's the legal requirement. Uh, but that's a really hard thing to forecast, uh, and so <clears throat> having multiple model forecasts of it, uh, it's hard. Okay, they actually want it three days in advance. That's really hard. But uh, <laughs> okay, but it's even hard the day, the morning of, uh, when everything's been mobilized and they're ready to burn and they're still going. Are we gonna, you know, is it gonna meet the requirements today? Uh, and I, it's very hard to predict on six-hour time scales that that particular parameter. It's going to fall, you know, it's going to be above the required, uh, you know, minimum here. Uh, you know, so we're trying to use uh, some machine learning things uh, to extract from different model forecasts from fact, you know, observed, op you know, local observations to improve those predictions. Uh, uh, but again, it's kind of a black box thing. Uh, you know, I built credibility with my customer because I'm very conservative uh, in recommending when uh, that probability is going to be reached. but. Uh, uh, you know, again, there's a whole side of decision uh, decision making that uh, comes into play here as well. Uh, you know, is 90% sufficient to go with the decision? Uh, do you really need 95% probability? Uh, you know, what's your you know sort of cost loss uh, aspects of those decisions? Uh, that those start to become aspects of uh, you know the machine learning and application of that to decision making. Uh, and again, I mean, you know, there's tons of examples of meteorology and forecasting that uh, <clears throat> where we're trying to use, you know, whatever data sets, observations, <clears throat> various model predictions to improve those, uh, you know, uh, automated predictions. Uh, and again, there's great distrust. Uh, well, I guess not. Everybody pulls out their iPhone and looks at the hourly weather forecast of <laughs> the weather app, right? <laughs> Uh, we've way oversold the capability there, but okay. Uh, we all trust it. No, so we all look at it. We all look at it. <laughs> Big difference. True. Yeah, so there's a lot packed into what, what you just heard, and we're, we're going to shift gears a little bit here and kind of open it up a little bit more to a, a little bit broader discussion. What I'd like to do is, in these cases that, that we've highlighted, um, if, if you could say, Kind of what's holding us back from being able to do a quote better job at informing decision makers, right? Whatever that means, and we kind of have to define what better means. And uh, as as we've seen, there's multiple constituents in making a decision. Sometimes those decision makers are actually at odds with each with each other. So so that's not easy. But if you could take a shot at the what's holding us back, and and then look at it from the other perspective of if. If, if resources weren't a constraint or if you could only get more something, what would that be, right? So in this case, what I've heard a lot of is, is more data the answer? Is more finely spaced data the answer? Is more consistent data the answer? Is more credible data the answer? Or is it the analytic? Is it, is it the algorithm? Or is it the ground truth? Or, you know, what component of what this is will help us ultimately, you know, do a better job? So, so what's holding us back and what would you, if you could fix something, what would be that something? Maybe those two things are one and the same, but take a shot at that. And I'm not going to go in order, just kind of whoever wants to go for it, just go for it. And, and this is where you can interact some here and ask and, and uh, talk a little bit. So whoever wants to take a shot at that. I, I want to actually follow up on um, some of Dr. Wilson's comments about stock assessments and fisheries, because I think that you know she, she talked about kind of one of the big challenges of moving beyond just looking at a single species and looking at, it, at just you know one animal and trying to bring in some of this other you know additional information. I think that's that's really a, I think a, a crux, especially for 
some of the more coastal pelagic species that are very, very dynamic, that are very environmentally driven, right? They're not assimilating many, many years of production over a system. You know, they, they're, they're, very, uh, they're very dynamic. They can boom really, really fast, and they can crash really fast. And so there's this, there's kind of a, a question of, well, what are the right indicators to use out there? We, there, there, was a, there was basically a really neat study that said, well, the temperature at Scripps Pier <laughs> off of, off of uh, La Jolla, that actually correlates really well if you look backwards at the recruitments of sardines. So let's fish harder when the temperature there is warmer and, it was, and, and, and fish less when it's cooler. And it was widely touted as one of these first examples of where the environment was really brought into you know, stock assessments and management. And in the last few years, the temperature was really warm and the stock of sardines collapsed. There was something more going on, basically. And so it kind of, uh, you know, it kind of drew people to this other question of the temporal scale at which we're using this information. Rather than refining better predictions based on what we know the status of the stock was a year or two ago, which is kind of the way it was done before, could we just use more real-time information? Rather than waiting a year and a half to set a quota after you do a survey, uh, can we you know, speed that system up? Like in South Africa for anchovy, they basically do a survey and within two weeks, there's a new quota based on that. And so the industry is very much, uh, it appeals to them because they wanna know when there's a lot of fish to catch, they wanna be able to fish them now. They don't wanna wait you know, a year and a half to be able to, to fish on a boom. At the same time, where the real effects of fishing are on a species like this is when they're in a collapse or when they're dropping. And so if, we, if there's a delay or a lag in when that's actually happening to when we can actually respond in terms of a decision being made and actually put into place, that, that can actually have dramatic consequences. We may essentially, this is one of the, the reasons why fishing took a while to respond to the recent collapse of the sardine fishery. Meanwhile, you've got you know, sea lions and birds you know, starving on beaches as a result, and, and, the, and the fishing pressure wasn't able to, to pull back hard enough. And so what's interesting is that from the industry's perspective, they would be much more willing to, uh, to fish uh, and, and with more precaution a lot of times if they could, they could make the decisions based on recent information. Uh, so it, I guess there's this kind of question of scale. The stock assessments do go back you know, 50, 70 years so we can understand the dynamics, but really understanding what's in the water or what the condition is right now, uh, even if there's uncertainty around that, that may be more than the precision you get from information that may be outdated because of how dynamic the system is. This is a, on a kind of slightly different scale than what you're talking about, but, but one of the, if we're talking about some of the technology issues, is that with, when you're talking about fisheries, I mean, our main, the main satellite data that we use is ocean color, which gives us a measure, a measure of chlorophyll. But chlorophyll is not, you know, chlorophyll is just chlorophyll. And what we really want is more um, species-specific um, data. I mean, particularly when we're talking about harmful algal blooms, you know, is, it, is this a harmful algal bloom? Is this is a pseudonychia? And so it, for that, there's, a, there's a, a real big push now to get a hyperspectral sensor that can make measurements in more than just seven or eight bands. And so that would be able to tell you like, a lot more about what's actually going on in the water. Um, so that's one issue. But the other issue that's, that we have with ocean color data is that since it's a visual measurement, whenever it's cloudy, of course it's never cloudy in Monterey, um, <laughs> you don't get any data. So that's part of the reason why there, there is a, a time delay, not obviously for years, but you know, where, where oftentimes you have to look at a month because if you just look at yesterday's data, there's nothing there and you have to average over a week or a month to get something that, that you know, looks like it, you know, with features and things like that. Um, but with SST, we don't have this issue so much because with SST, we, have, we can make measurements in the uh, microwave and in the IR, you can see through, through clouds in the microwave, but also we have geostationary. And so there's a, um, a big put, there's a push going on currently to get geostationary ocean color data, which I think would be really crucial because with geostationary, you get a multiple looks a day and basically you'd be averaging over the day and you could you really be able to get a much more complete, um, almost a complete image in a day. Uh, currently, there's only one geostationary ocean color satellite in the, the, um, the South Koreans. There was an effort about 10 years ago for NOAA to put one on and they decided not to do that. Um, NASA is currently uh, working on one and it'll maybe get launched before I retire. 
so what I've heard you all say is there's a, uh, kind of what you described, there's a little bit of a, there's a loop between making the decision, right, and, and the output of a, of a model, and you're trying to close that loop in, in some sense, Jeff, is, is what I think I, I, I heard you say, is that that cycle time becomes important. I think from a military context, we understand that from kind of the, the time value of information, right, in making, in making this, we, we see that. Um, but again, I kind of am pulling on the thread of, is more data the answer, right? What, what Kara said was, is better quality data the answer? And in, where quality was, I have more spectral bands to look at. That way I can find attributes that are gonna tell me something that tell me if chlorophyll is there or not. The same could be true in, in your scenarios as well, that you know, you're kind of grasping around in the dark to say, does this correlate with this? Um, there's a school that would say, well, just take more and more data, and it's, it's, it's somehow you can learn that, right? It can be learned by an algorithm or by a machine, but uh, it, the social sciences kind of lend themselves to that. Look at what's been done with Google and, you know, uh, uh, you know Google flu trends or predictive policing, where you can pull in a bunch of, of, of data and say something more. The question is, in the environmental sciences like this, is that the case, right? Is it the case that more is better? finer is better or, or not? And I don't know if there's one answer for each of you, but that's kind of what I'm trying to get at a little bit. Or is it the model itself? Does it go back to the model that we're building? Thoughts on that? And again, you're welcome to join in. Well, go ahead, yeah, Paula. I, I, my quick thought is that um, I'm related to this. I appreciate your honesty, Bruce, when you said perhaps you are the anchor and I am the anchor um, with culture of understanding what does this, how do, how do we get a critical mass of believers in the black box? How do we get the people to change their behavior to go from prediction to real time to not only the technology but the people and how do they behave differently because of that? And the use of algorithms versus the scientific prediction and those equations. So I, I see that holding back is I'm part of the problem in that because I don't understand what that is. Although I believe it's where I need to go, I just don't know how to get there. So I appreciate the example where you had someone, a fisherman, believe in the black box because he had a personal experience with it. And so it's almost as if we have to create ex personal experiences where we believe because the burn-off happened at the right time where we understand because the stock appeared when we said it was going to, or, or whatever that might be. And that's very difficult for me to comprehend because it seems very individual to each one of us in this room as to whether we will believe in something that we've never experienced before. How will the war, war fighter be able to that? I'm curious. Uh, I, I mean, uh, amen. I'm looking to some of the folks in the camouflage around here. and they got to believe our forecast, right? <laughs> They have to believe when we say go into that. They need to trust that we say go into that area and it's good. Or go look at the submarine is in front of you, not behind you. Go forward in this direction. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so it has to do with the, uh, the credibility and the black box. Um, I, think, I think it's an easy sell to say that the black box applies for a large set of possibilities. Um, but my question is, how do you resolve uh, when the black box disagrees with your particular experience? Um, how do you uh, how do you use big data to take this black box to inform a decision for a whole set of possibilities and narrow that down to this particular captain is going to do this particular thing? Um, and I think that's I, I I've seen. Uh, attempts to use big data to do that problem. Um, but I think that those solutions are, uh, A, easy to bust, and then B, are really, really detrimental to the credibility of your box in the, in the, in the launch room. So I'm, I'm curious, how do you resolve that particular um, that particular issue, particularly for cases like the ASM problem, where your number of data points is like three? <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's, that's, okay. that's good. I'll, I'll take a cut unless somebody else. I mean, in, in my view, it is about one, not overselling uh, the solution. Uh, two is, are you improving their capability to eliminate alternatives in their decisions? 
So in the adaptive ASW that I was talking about, okay, so what they have now, let's say, are, are far, furthest on circles in making their, you know, search plans for day three. Uh, it, it seems that uh, having uh, some machine learning input to their decision, prior, so it's still not automated decision, you still have a human in the loop making the decision, they just have more information now, and they understand where that information comes from. They can decide to not use it. Uh, but, but I would say that's part of the journey, is building that credibility and seeing the value of additional um, uh, freedom of maneuver in their decision space. I guess I would add, too, that, uh, you know, there's the, you know, really representing the full distribution of possibilities. That, you know, you really have to get the full probability space out there and have an informed customer that knows. And yes, sometimes what happens is out here in the tail of distribution. Unfortunately, that's true. We'd all love it to, uh, you know, line the most probable solution, but uh, the reality is sometimes that's not what happens. Uh, and, you know, customers have to understand that. Uh, and, you know, I think there's an education part. I mean, if I sort of think about, you know, what Marcus is trying to get us to think about, it, you know, what, what are the, you know, one of the anchors, and I think it is getting close to the customers and, and really, you know, being able to inform them of how to make use of this full probabilistic information uh, in, a, in a meaningful way to make decisions. And that's where, okay, if, you're, if your decision is very sensitive, uh, that, yeah, you might want, you, you, you may be waiting for the 99% uh, probability of occurrence uh, before you even think about making that decision. Uh, <clears throat> whereas, you know, most of us, we're fine, you know, the weatherman says it's going to rain today with a 30% chance, uh, no one thinks about it, you know, who cares if I get a little wet, it's okay. Uh, you know, other decisions are much more critical uh, and you're going to wait for a much higher probability to make that decision, but uh, uh, I think there's that education piece. I mean, one thing that the weather service is trying to change their mode of operations uh, dramatically uh, in this country in terms of uh, you know, no longer actually being in the pro, you know, in the business of actually making forecasts. That's going to be an automated process. They're going to be with customers interpreting the weather information, the probabilistic information, uh, so that uh, they're getting the best use of the product uh, and with knowledgeable people in the loop. And I think that's a, you know, that's a major paradigm shift uh, in the way we've done weather forecasting in this country. Uh, and. Uh, you know, and I think that that's one of the things that has to happen in terms of you know big data. Yeah, big data helps us maybe make a better black box, make it more informed in terms of an appropriate probability distribution. Uh, but then having the expert uh, be able to interpret that better for the customer is uh, is probably a critical piece. And yeah, I was going to say that it, I'm an advocate for models, and without models, you can't predict much further than just a, a couple minutes or whatever, a couple days ahead. And so you have to have that, but the trouble, of course, is, you know, with the big data, what data do you need to collect, you know, in order to be able to inform your, your model? And you have to have some guy who's an expert or some woman an expert that knows how to interpret the data and actually put, the, put that in to improve the model. I mean, we're always just trying to improve a model so that we can do some prediction. We can, Uh, big question is, everyone assumes the data comes in this nice package. And as someone who collects data all the time with my students, they learn in the end that the analytics is actually easy, but getting the data into a format that can run the code or analytics is 90% of the work. So I don't see how it's easy to get variety into the so-called data that it just fits in the simple package that you may use it for. No, no disagreement there, I don't think. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I see it as big as... Yeah, it, it is a big issue, and that's one of the things that um, my lab has been working on for a long time. So my, um, my lab actually started out next to... Uh, we were a small uh, trailer next to Fleet Numerical, and it was a bunch of modeling data that they weren't using, and uh, it was... Roy Mendelson, who's um, still with our, our lab today, thought, you know, biologists could use this, fisheries people could use this. And so the Environmental Research Division was started as basically 
you know, collecting model data to use it in, in, other, um, in other ways. And ever since then, we've been a group of, of data scientists and, and data people kind of working together to um, try to make data more useful. And one of the things that, that we have developed is um, uh, a data provider called Erdap. And it's basically a way of trying to make data uh, more accessible both to users and to computers. So um, Erdap is a, uh, what's called a RESTful service. That means your entire data uh, request can be defined by your, a URL. So I can send you a URL that will make you a map. You can change one part of it to say, rather than PNG, to say MATLAB, and then it downloads the MATLAB data. Um, so you can read it directly into MATLAB. You can make calls in R that will just directly get it, so you don't even have to go to Erdap. So it's, it's very, um, it's very powerful, um, as I said, for computers to, to talk to it and for um, users as well. We have um, on the ERDAP at our lab, we have over, um, I think, 1,700 data sets now. That's not just uh, it's satellite data, but it's also in situ data. We have all the Argo float data in there. We have all the Cal Coffee station data. Um, we have underway data from, from um, the NSF fleets and the NOAA fleets. So there's a, a lot of different data that we um, kind of gather together to try to make it easier for people. That's one of the things we talk about in our classes. Uh, I was, okay. No, I was going to go through my list of anchors, but <laughs> you have my list now. Well, yeah, I guess this kind of goes into one of the anchors I was going to mention. But the you know this question of getting data, especially if you're dealing with the you know the fishing sector, right? I mean, you know they view the they view their own data much probably like people involved in warfare view like you know the positions of all my you know <laughs> my, my, my you know my ships. I mean, they're 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 important business decisions, and they, they view it as proprietary information. I mean, the, the the where the fish are biting, where the crabs are. I mean, that is valuable information that if if you give away in hopes of you know some regulator having a better data set right <laughs> the, the, that's you know there's important issues in terms of you know whether you view uh, that that is you're giving it to an opponent or not there's also the question of if i show the regulator my best fishing spots is that going to be the next spot that they want to put a big closure on because they want to protect you know protect something in there right so the idea of sharing information in a competitive environment uh, there's a, there's a strong disincentive to provide it there, as well as uncertainty about uh, about the you know how a regulator or an NGO like Oceana may take this data and then use it against you. And I think where where we've seen that overcome is, I mean, oftentimes the benefits of of sharing information. Uh, outweigh you know, the, the alternative. When there's a lot of illegal fishing, for example, going on, I mean, Indonesia just basically uh, pr decided to provide all their private vessel monitoring systems data for all of their small boats that don't have the publicly available AIS and share it with the entire world because they're so concerned about the illegal fishing. And many of their own fishermen supported it because it's a way of getting at this, this larger problem. Also, if there are ways to aggregate information, so maybe I'm not interested in knowing exactly your fishing spot or who was fishing there or who caught what, but I have a general sense that the northern part of Monterey Bay, there's a lot of activity right now, even if there's a few day delay or some aggregation of the information that prevents someone from using it against you in real time in terms of that competitiveness, there are some ways that we've seen that alleviated, but I do think in terms of, I mean, right now you look at Global Fishing Watch, I would say the answer to your question is, yeah, we do need more data. We're missing all the boats that are less than, uh, you know, 100 tons, right? I mean, it's, it's we're missing a huge part of the, the puzzle, so how do we get at that information and, and how do you provide the actual incentives that outweigh the disincentives to be freely providing information? I mean, we see this with the research community in terms of sharing data, I mean, I'm sure, that some folks in the Navy would have really awesome data sets of seafloor maps that I would love to know where where some of this stuff is, but I mean, that's, you know, there's a national defense issue too. So, I mean, I guess these are some of the issues where the data may exist, but it's not in the right hands, or it's not it's being able to be assimilated into the decision maker's hands. Right, so there's a lot of complications there, but that's not totally unfamiliar in a military context, like, like sharing with coalition partners and, and, and things like that, where you think about different levels. Uh, the gentleman's question there, though, about yes, I mean, 80% of your work oh, is in getting the data into into. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 
into, into some form you can use. And then you've got you know smart solutions to that, and where where you put something up that it can be queried in, in many different ways. But it, but it takes some buy-in for people to agree that yes, we will put the data up, and somebody will foot the bill for an initial curation of that or, or something along those lines. But we've gone really far with services you know, like AWS or Google to allow us to have access to these sets that make it so easy for you through an API to just grab a subset of it and do what you need to do that perhaps that would break down silos of saying this is mine and I'm not going to share it. That's, you know, that, that might be, of course the reality is it's not the real world always, but that's my answer to your question is I think we can work on that. There are technologies that I think can help us along there. Um, but that's what you hear with data science, right? It's 80% it's, it's of the work is munging the data. Yes? So I'm going to take a different track by that question. Um, my question to the panel is, uh, how does citizen science fit into this conversation? So is it a case where civilian reported or public reported data is going to contribute to a data overload? in this conversation, or is it an opportunity for us to um, gain more user buy-in in things like machine learning and big ocean data sets to help us solve particular problems um, or take certain actions, um, and therefore improve interfaces with, with data, essentially, to make decisions? Uh, OK, I'll comment just from the weather side. <laughs> Because, I mean, actually, it's fairly mature in terms of, yes, we, we love civilian collected data uh, as well. I mean, there's, the Weather Service has a whole cooperative observer network uh, of people willing to make weather observations, uh, and that is a, a useful and rich data set. Uh, you know, I think uh, the, a critical aspect is how do you quantify you know, sort of the quality control issues uh, uh, and you know, sort of, yeah, they didn't go through all the effort that uh, Jamie's students do to, you know, QC the data and get it to a point where you can actually do data analytics on it. They just made some random, uh, you know, temperature observation. It may be useful, it may not be, uh, you know, but I think there's actually machine learning tools to sort of help uh, in, making, in making some of those data quality inferences from known quality sensors that are not that far, you know, that not that far geographically removed. So, um, and I think it's a, I think it would be great. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, civilian, uh, you know, <coughs> made observations are mostly in the surface base. Uh, I mean, I suppose in the ocean. Uh, Fishermen might do some sort of uh, observation underwater, or you know, in the atmosphere. We'd love to have people actually make, you know, vertical structure measurements, but that doesn't really happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, could, it can contribute considerably. Uh, so the thing I would add is, uh, in, in our arena, we work with the intelligence community. The intelligence community makes a lot of use. They looked at these issues in terms of open source data and making their assessments. Uh, there's, uh, you know, they're building enterprise sort of processes and approaches to be able to tag the data with multiple assertions about the veracity of the data. You know, so, you know, it is about responsible use, but it's also recognizing you don't have any other sources in, in, in some cases. So I would say it's something that um, needs to be developed and makes, makes total sense to me. Is this data that folks know that they're reporting, or? <laughs> <laughs> That's another topic. <laughs> another channel. Uh, there's a question here, and then we'll come back. Who, who's the question here? Uh, yeah. So my question is more so, um, if we have more access to data, or as we get more and more data, it means more and more people access it to it just in general, to then, if we're looking at needing to put uh, laws together or legislate based upon, or recommendations of legislation based upon that, that then people can then take that that good data, let's assume that it's, it's good, uh, proper data, that then somebody can take that and manipulate it to say whatever they want. I had a, uh, my uncle who is an accountant always said, I can make your numbers say whatever I want, want them to say. And I, th and I think that's real here, but then when you have the scientists and the real experts that properly go through the data, 
you're not heard because you don't have as many Twitter followers <laughs> as somebody else. And I, I honestly think that that can be an issue moving forward as we're trying to inform the public in general about things that we go through the scientific process about that then we get, we get pushed away because we're not as loud about it. And like I said, we don't have many Twitter followers. So that's a, that's a problem that I, I would see moving forward in trying to inform and use the data properly um, as far as an anchor. But that's just my bet. Do you have your uncle's business card with you? <laughs> so you're pulling on the credibility thread of, of the data, right? The veracity of the data. Right. Any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, yeah, I guess in terms of just seeing many decisions made by voting bodies, right? Oftentimes, decision-making bodies, it's not just a whole bunch of scientists, right? I mean, yeah. oftentimes they'll have a, a scientific decision, you know, making committee or advisory body. But ultimately, I think most people want to know that there was some human being that, you know, that was able to look at this and kind of ask some of those questions. I mean, some of the, the reason that there has not been legislation yet to automatically, you know, close and open certain areas on the, on the whale thing is that people want to actually know that, that, okay, so say there is a red light or a red flag, right? It's a, it's a high warning, high risk scenario, right? Rather than having something automatic that's done by an algorithm or something that's predetermined, the basic decision politically was we want to actually have a set of eyes on this. We want to make sure that you know that we're aware of a power dynamic in whoever the decision making body is to prevent it from going too far either way, right? Uh, and and so having you know NGOs on this panel, scientists, fishermen that are actually familiar with certain areas to together create here's what the response is going to be to a high risk event has really been the critical piece. It's something that all the machine learning and computer models can't really do. It's how it's it's this question of taking that information, you know, and assimilating, you know, what are the local whale watching communities seeing that they're providing daily information with the North Pacific High Index and, you know, information on anchovies and putting it all together to say, what are we actually going to do about this? I mean, I think that's that's probably what makes a good captain at sea. It's 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 not that it's a machine. It's it's a human being that is making judgment. And I think having, you know, some semblance of diversity in views. So it's not just a Twitter follower or a scientist. That 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 information can be discussed and together. I think that's probably where the best decisions are made. But it's 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 definitely not a science. It's probably more of an art. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, so, um, so I think big data is cool, but you also have to take a step back and go, is this the future? Is the idea that we're just going to have more data sets or the bigger data sets used to simplify the equation? So we can go back to, I know overly simplified, with the temperature at Scripps Pier. We do we use big data just to simplify it to get us to the 80% solution and, hey, now we can use that one metric. We don't need everything. The scientists, like, hey, we can geek out on it, but <laughs> the public, hey, give us that temperature at the end of scripts. Um, is are we are we going to go back, or is the idea that keep I, I, going? I, I think we're that? gonna. I think we're gonna go in. We're going in that direction, but not. We, we don't. We don't need to get big data to measure the, the temperature at scripts here because we have a thermometer that already does that for yeah. us. But what we can use the big data for is to to basically you know, use data and use these different data streams to, to come up with proxies for things that we can't directly measure. You know, um, and so, I mean, for an example, I, I think of this as uh, a very good example with the NOAA is there's a program called Coral Watch. We're really into our watches in NOAA. Um, <laughs> and so what Coral Watch does is it it's basically looks at the bleaching for corals. And it's, it's mostly a temperature threshold. So they use SST data. Um, they've been doing this for a number of years. But they basically they take that, all that SST data and they, they Basically, what they come down to is a product that that tells the managers when this reef is going to be at, at risk for bleaching, and it uses you know what temperature it is, how long it's been at that temperature. So it and and but this is you know this is a product that's taken them years to develop in terms of working with these managers for years. And at first, they just put out their temperature maps, and the managers were like, 
well, yeah, but you know, what I really want to know is, you know, how long has it been greater than this? So, you know, a lot of iterations. But basically, now there's a, you get a map that's very sort of simplified. It looks, you know, there's kind of areas that are red and areas that are orange. But a whole lot of data went into getting that. So it's getting at answers that you can't just, you know, put a temperature in and, and get. And isn't that where all the machine learning stuff is really going and building the models of doing things like the, you know, dimension reduction and identifying the features that really somehow on past data sets have been able to, uh, you know, create an 80, 90 percent uh, accurate solution, which in 80 percent of the cases might be good enough. So we're going to overload it for a while and then kind of shrink it back down. I, I would guess that's going to be a part of it. but. Again, I'm not a, I don't know anything, I'm an anchor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the experience with habitat protection, the, the, you know, we watch the North Pacific and Pacific Fishery Management Councils get bombarded with, you know, if you, if you think about this question of ocean habitats and all the different things that could be there, there's temperature, there's what sediment grain size there is, there's currents, I mean, there's so many different things, and they were literally just bombarded with all this stuff. To, you know, and it was basically too much. There wasn't enough of that distilling and synthesis. And ultimately, it was Oceana working with some scientists that said, hey, let's show some pictures of some really pretty deep sea coral reefs. That was really what, those areas got the highest level of protection because people could actually get it. They could see it. It wasn't some algorithm that didn't make a whole lot of sense that was kind of you know, a black box. It was that it was distilled, and we made something that was presented in a very complicated way to decision makers. We said, "Look, this is simple. If we know that there are these deep sea coral reefs that are thousands of years old, we shouldn't be running a trawl over it." So I think sometimes, you know, and, and I think there was some science that went into that, right? We learned by looking at science that those types of biogenic habitats are more sensitive based on surveys scientifically that looked at different habitat types. But trying to break it down to a decision maker who's not a scientist, you know, is you know was ultimately successful. People may say, well, you, you know, you may be happy it's because you had more Twitter followers, or you you had some poster child, beautiful, you know, deep sea coral you could show. But ultimately, that was more compelling than the big data was at the time. Let me ask in the last five minutes that we have any quick wins you see, any low hanging fruit that's just out there right now, easy to easy to tackle that might help in anything that we've talked about here. Well, so I'll, I'll and I'm gonna. I didn't get to share my anchor, so I'm gonna work that in here a little okay. bit here. So, <laughs> well, seriously, I'm trying to. So I think all of us. You want more data, more different type of data to be able to get more information. We need more. We need the intelligence data. Brought, our situational awareness data brought into our spaces with our METOC data to run the analytics to support uh, prediction and prescription sort of things. Um, we don't have all the data science skills that we need. You know, we're, we're geophysical science folks, and in fact, there's a competition. You know, a lot of geophysical scientists, I don't know if this is you, I would say no because you're a very open minded and handsome man. But, <laughs> you know, they, the data scientist is sort of, you know, uh, uh, is a, a different approach to, yeah. to this that is not necessarily. So it feels like to me that there's a, the quick win. So NOAA has this um, big data project stuff that has been going on where they've established a framework based on the uh, uh, Open Commons Consortium. And Marcus, we've talked about it a little bit where they said, Okay, so we want to, you know, as NOAA, we've got to uh, promote economic development. We want to have researchers get access to data that they all can get access to. Uh, we want to, uh, people that want to build services, uh, decision services on top of this data. So let's partner with a, um, a cloud provider, infrastructure service provider. Let's create uh, sort of a ecosystem sandboxes for different groups of people around data sets and problem sets that they care about. And they have a governance mechanism in place of how to sort of build these ecosystems. So, uh, you know, I think with the cloud emerging, uh, with the flexibility there to, to size up and to size down, uh, with the fact that we all need this data and we can't, we don't have the infrastructure ourselves, uh, that we might be willing to actually share some of our data to, for that <coughs> added benefit. So, so you're so. seeing that as potentially an easy win if you have 
you know, a data set that's readily accessible, that's in a format that you can, you know, scale or slice however you want to do whatever you want. What you're saying is that's almost a, it's a good thing because it also develops credibility in believing that I can do things, my own application with that data. Is that kind of what you're saying? It, well, it also supports the issue that was brought up of, uh, they bring in data curators that become part of the ecosystem to go out to the different sources and, you know, support doing all that nasty work, bringing it into this common space for the data scientists to develop their, their algorithms, do the research, and as I say, they have ways for people to, quote, pay to participate, et cetera. So it's an easy win because we have a model out there. And NOAA's done it and other groups have done it, so I would just throw that out there as take a look at that and maybe develop a project around the Open Commons Consortium, NOAA, NOAA Big Data Project. Thing. Thank you. Other thoughts on kind of low-hanging fruit, easy wins, and any? I, I mean, I don't necessarily think we're that far away from some of these things, but I mean, imagine if we didn't have buoy lines between a buoy and a trap, and you could just retrieve a trap you know, without having the lines in the water, right? I mean, that there's technological solutions that are basic like that. Or, you know, I'd love to, to know whether you could use a satellite to figure out where fishing traps are, are. you know, could, could a satellite see a buoy? I mean, can we, can, I mean, if, if you could use that information, we would save, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but in the, in, in the world that we're dealing with, I mean, to, we're paying people to go fly over with airplanes to go count this stuff, right? So I think the technology, the technological solutions to some of these problems are, are extremely promising. And I think just in general, you know, I mean, I'm excited to be here today because I, I, I mean, I think about the ocean all the time and I'm here in a room of folks that are thinking about it in a different way than I am that are probably looking at a lot of the same data sets and probably have, you know, amazing data. And I mean, the, the, the crossover there and the potential, I think, for solving some of these problems by putting together different silos of experts on these issues, I think, is is extremely, uh, it makes me extremely optimistic in this work. So I'm really happy to be here for that. I just want to echo that. I think the big win is right here. What we're seeing and we're participating with is these diverse approaches to uh, the same problem. Or, or the same focus. And so I want to thank Maureen for bringing us together in that. Thanks, Paula. Other thoughts? Um, kind of wrap up with the uh, great ideas that you all have had in listening and interacting? Just a follow-on question. What is the mechanism to do that? How do we keep this going? How do we keep the communication going? How do we publish our data sets? How do we, what's the next step to do that? Because I think it's really important. Uh, Sounds like Marine is a form to get us together. I think the you know the part of it is uh, you know what is the re what is the platform that would host a common data set, right? Um, I think that's really the tangible thing that you you were referring to, and I'm not sure if there is such a thing um, or or not. But or, that's or even just the just the catalog, not necessarily hosting the data. What that is out there, yeah. yeah catalogs yeah. and interfaces, and you know. All that that's stuff. a great. That's a great idea as far as, you know, an easy thing to do, right? Um, catalog it. Thoughts on that? I mean, I'm not real up on it, but didn't the Coastal Ocean Observing System try and do some of that to where you could query, okay, there's this data set, this is sort of characteristics that different institutions uh, contributed to that. Uh, I don't know how robust and current uh, it may be, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, going down some path like that uh, would be, you know, very helpful. You know, fundamentally, it's usually people and dollars that make those things happen, and those are usually in short supply, but... Uh, <laughs> right, uh, but, but I mean, if, if yeah. architected right, you could have somebody host a, a, a data platform, basically, that several institutions could get to. That's really what we'd be talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. And I know our, the our IT folks here, ITAX, has a consortium, uh, I'm not exactly, Scenic or something? Scenic, right? Maybe that's a beginning, right? I, I, but I could take that back and talk to ITAX and see what they think about that. But it's within, it should be within reach because we're in, a, we're in an era where 
hosting stuff is it should not be an expensive proposition where everybody's got to keep their own silos. And it could be a very easy start with some data set. Isn't that uh, kind of like AWS Earth? <coughs> yeah. yeah, Earth on AWS? Yes, yes, yes. right. There are also you need international the efforts to try to create common data sets or at least uh, portals where you can put your common data sets, like Ovis and other, that there's a variety of different ones which starts to become some, somewhat of a problem but also becomes somewhat of a solution. Um, but just from the UN sustainable development goals, a lot of these efforts have been really trying to be pushed forward to think in the next 10 to 20 years, where are we going to be with all of these large data sets? And so there are some efforts that are being made to try to create those common portals. So since I'm an anchor kind of guy, I, I sort of, so 20, I was at Adam Bari in 1989 mm -hmm. for about 10 years. and. Uh, one of the big problems we worked on in those days was, you know, it's going to be this interdisciplinary science institute, this natural laboratory out there. We're going to have all this data. We're going to integrate it. And within Ambari, that was that. You know, there's a lot of progress made there. Uh, since then, you know, I've been in the uh, Navy community and you know, back in the science community. And, and these uh, catalog issues, the metadata issues, there's tons of efforts out there about that. And so I would ask the question, how far has that gotten us to what we're talking about here? And so my sense is the way you get there is not starting with the data. You start with the problem set that excites a certain subset of people that have an incentive to come together on this. That will look, And I think this is back to the NOAA big data thing. Is they, they find the, the problem that is interesting to uh, enough critical mass of folks and they go to their cloud provider and, and they go to the data providers and they go to the uh, data curators that, you know, and they, they pull together the, not only the infrastructure they need, but each community might have their own platform, their own software platform, their tool sets that they want to use. So I, I guess, sorry, the short answer is that you got to start with the problem set that people care about, identify the data sources, how you're going to get it into a common environment for a fusion analysis sort of thing. Yeah, so maybe that's a natural for something like Marine is identify something common like that and do like Bruce had said. Okay, we got time for one more question. I believe you had a question. Uh, sir, so um, my, my question is, uh, what are the uh, specific set of skills uh, that is required for the new generation of the forecasters and the decision makers required in this uh, new scenario of this uh, big data? And uh, how prepared we are to train uh, this new set of uh, new hands? Uh, when this big data is coming and how how we prepare to deal with that this new, uh, new generation of the all right, I'm going to take a stab at that as an educator <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I'm an anchor too in terms of uh, I'm a traditional meteorologist so I want to teach the geophysical equations and understanding of the you know physics of the atmosphere uh, and uh, making predictions that way but uh, Okay, I recognize the need to understand, you know, sort of the statistical probabilistic aspects as well. Uh, and it's a hard bridge, okay, um, in terms of, you know, getting really proficient at, you know, say, developing machine learning tools and utilizing those and becoming, you know, quite knowledgeable about the, that sort of approach uh, is, you know, in some sense takes you away from becoming a really good physical scientist uh, and but you know we need knowledge in both areas to be fully effective uh, and I think that's you know that is a challenge and you know we have to keep working and trying to blend some of those things into you know our modern solutions like okay I love to teach solutions uh, from the 1950s that still work but uh, uh, but you know maybe there's other ways uh, to approach things. You know, like teams? Yes. None of us can hold it all in our head. Right. right. And, and that's the thing is you're being educated as a domain expert. It, you have some awareness of the engineering, the data engineering, the data science. But in the real putting something together to solve the problem, it'll take a team of three people really to make that happen, right? Um, where you've got to have that. So the challenge for all of us is to create the conditions for which that can happen. 
but in the curriculum, I think there's there's got to be an appreciation for what some of these advanced analytic tools can do for you, and some of the data engineering tools. And I'd like to think that I don't know if we're, we're, what institution you're at, but like at CSUMB, they have a wonderful data science program that's that's starting there, so you can take advantage of that there. And uh, it truly is interdisciplinary, which is what's exciting about this. Okay, I think other questions we can probably hit uh, at the Trident Room, uh, and, and uh, I'm going to let Kellen come back up. Let's thank our panelists one more time.